Shrimpers TV for the fourth episode of Shrimpers Talks. Today's guest has made 519 appearances for all club competitions, bagging 136 goals with 172 of those appearances and 45 goals at South End United. It's former Shrimper and Western Sydney Wanderers forward Simon Cox. Simon, it's uh, great to have you on today on the channel. Uh, I want to start today by talking to you uh, about your career and how it started. So you joined your home club town of uh, or hometown club of Reading at the age of nine, if that's right. And what was it like for you as a youngster being in the youth system and then coming up to the senior team to get your first appearance? Yeah, uh, thanks for having me on. Um, it, do you know what? No it was great. Um, I grew up watching Reading at, at the old Elm Park and uh, followed them all the way through to uh, the move to the Medeski Stadium. And then... Um, I was able to sort of make my way through the youth system with some great coaches um, and then, you know, doing so well in the in the academies and then being able to get my chance in the first team was uh, was was a dream for me because it was I was a young boy growing up watching Reading and that's all I wanted to do, really. And uh, you said about the Majeski Stadium, obviously, a ring nice stadium, quite modern. Uh, what was it like moving sort of that transition from the old stadium into the new one? Yeah, I, I remember uh, they they hadn't really, they hadn't even got it ready for the first game. It, the, the day we, we had Luton first game of the season. Um, and I remember people still screwing in seats and making sure that all the Everything was ready for the for the first game, like all the way lead up to whatever time you open a stadium, twelve o'clock or so. So um, it was a rush, but you know one that was needed. Elm Park had been sold, and it was um, going to uh, a, a developer to to build housing. Um, but for Reading Football Club to grow, they needed to be into a, a brand new stadium and and one that could house multiple events, not let alone football. And was that quite a big stage for you, obviously, moving from the youth system into the senior squad? That must have been quite a big occasion for both you and your family as well. Yeah, I mean, I remember the the day I sort of got the the call that I was going to be involved in my first game and um, I didn't sleep the night before. I was so excited. I, I just wanted to, you know, wanted to know that the game was there and, and I was being involved. I was only on the bench, but just that thought of potentially coming on and and sort of fulfilling a dream of mine to to go and play at the stadium and and in front of the fans was was one of the things that sort of drove me on really and did you find out 24 hours prior to kickoff then that you were going to be starting or at least making the starting squad well i knew that there was a chance between me and Shane Long it was a uh, i think it was kind of a toss up between the two of us which one would make the the sort of bench um and I sort of got to the stadium, went into the dressing room. My my shirt was up, his shirt was up, and I don't think they'd still made their their uh, their choice on who who it was going to be. And then um, I got a sort of little curly finger from the assistant manager, and he and he said, um, you know, you're on the bench tonight. And I was like, geez, like that that's you know big for me. So I was obviously really happy. Um, I was just happy to be involved. And then all of a sudden. I think we were sort of two or three nil up at the time and or three one up and, and I got the chance to come on for I think fifteen minutes or so at the end and um I, would, I just I just ran around. I think I gave about five or six hours away <clears throat> just because I was so excited and um yeah, I was really happy to be involved. And as a forward obviously at South End, very rarely did we see you start on the subs bench, often the first time you'd look out for it in the starting eleven lineup. As a striker, when you were on the bench, obviously at previous clubs or at Southend, uh, is it sort of you want the striker to have a bad game? Like, are you hoping for them to? Because obviously you want to help the squad out, but essentially you still want to get on the pitch and score goals for your squad. Well, ultimately, every every forward wants to be playing, every forward wants to be scoring goals and, and winning games. But when when that odd, odd occasion that you're you're on the bench or uh, you know you're not selected. You don't will you don't wish ill on on the team or anybody in in front of you because ultimately you're there to to be part of a squad. Um, mm. But maybe self consciously you sort of sat there thinking, you know, if if he doesn't score today or or we get beat or anything else like that, there's always that sort of niggling in the back of your mind that you know there's a chance you might come on and, and if you can score or 
um, you know, maybe next game if we haven't won, there's a chance you might get back in the team. And you've obviously mentioned Shane Long and a lot of other strikers that you've played with uh, during your career. Is there anyone who stands out for you as a brilliant strike partner? Brilliant strike partner or uh, brilliant player I've played with? Because uh, strike partner. They can be two different people. <laughs> strike partner. Who would you, if you were looking at the starting 11 squad and you wanted someone to pair up top of you to feed you in for goals or for you to assist them, who would you want it to be? Do you know what, right? I loved, I loved playing alongside Hops, Tom Hopper. Um, workhorse, um, somebody who, who, you know, was able to do all the horrible side. I played at Swindon with Billy Painter, um, very similar to, to Tom. Uh, I, I like the sort of the big, horrible striker that, that can sort of take all the the batters and bruises that, that big, horrible defenders give you. And I try and sort of stay away from that that area and, and try and stick the ball in the net. Um but yeah, I mean, those, those are the sort of strikers that I like um, to play alongside. And there's obviously been quite a few standout moments in your career, especially at South End. Obviously, we saw that hat trick, that comeback against Portsmouth, and the last game of the season, obviously last season. Um, what was it like for you being in that squad? What were the emotions like knowing, like going into that last game, that you had to beat Sunderland to have a chance of staying up? Do you know what? Um, actually, without sort of sounding um, big headed or, or anything like that. I, I kind of felt that after having a really decent season, 17 goals, um, however many assists or whatever it was, um, I went into the last game. We, we played Rochdale on my birthday um, and we got beat. And I was in the dressing room after the game and I was saying, I sort of, sort of said to the lads and the, and the management and everything else and I was like look don't worry about it it's not the it's not the end of the world here uh, we, we've got one more game we've got one more chance at this and with Plymouth not winning um, it all ends up on our shoulders whatever we do we'll, we'll make sure we'll, we're on the right end of it um, and you kind of self-consciously knew that Sunderland were potentially going to rest a few p- players because they were obviously in the playoffs. Um, yeah, of course. So we kind of had a, an inkling that us at full strength and us at you know f- full tilt in terms of performance level, we would give them a game. Um, the worst thing was is that it was at 5.30 or 6 o'clock or whatever the game was. Mm. It was a long, long time to wait. Waking up in the morning and having the whole day to sort of get, your mind, about it. Yeah, get your mind around mm. what could potentially happen, all the scenarios that could happen if we draw, if we win, if we lose. So that was the worst thing. But we got to the ground and actually you could see that the boys were actually quite calm, uh, which was good uh, because we, we sort of realised that Going into that game, no matter what happened, we gave ourselves a chance in the last day to to produce. Um, and then obviously we come out with the right result in the end. Um, and honestly, it was one of those where I, I, I kind of thought that in my head, whatever whatever was going to happen, we would do it. Mm. For, you know, whether we if we lost and and Plymouth lost. And we stayed up. I always felt I never, I never really had one thought in my mind that we would go down. Um, and as mad as that says, as bad as the season was, and and how much bad luck and stuff we had, I never thought. I'd always, I, I'd quite happily have taken it going down to the last day uh, because I knew we'd have a chance at for a one-off game. Uh, you play the, uh, you play the game. You don't play the occasion, and then all of a sudden you, you can sort of get together as a group and make sure that you, you produce for one another. And I think one thing that really shocked the fans was, like you said, how calm the players were. Obviously, uh, we'd experienced a few last-minute shockers, uh, not just for ourselves, but uh, on other teams as well. Obviously, we had Blackpool away where there was a very controversial <laughs> penalty given to uh, uh, given against us and that Black- goal Blackpool could have seen us down. Blackpool was a last-minute uh, own goal. Walsall yeah. Was- the last minute. Uh, oh, of course, yeah. Walsall was the penalty, and then Taylor Moore own goal. Obviously, that was controversial. I think team selection as well. Saying about Taylor Moore, I think a lot of people really, really thought then, who do you want to start? Because we had the likes of Turner, White, and we really wondered what what we're going to play. And then obviously we saw the score coming in. 
when you saw the starting lineup um, for that game, did you or you were waiting for the starting lineup to come in? Did you really hope that you were in that starting squad for the last game of the season? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Like um, it. It was quite interesting actually because we had a chat. A couple of us had a chat with with uh, Kevin Bond uh, on the Friday. We trained at the stadium. We wanted to sort of get familiar with, as much as that sounds strange, get familiar with what the surroundings would be like and try and sort of drum up the the emotions of what Saturday would have been been like. Um, and we sat down with Kevin Bond and we went out to training a little bit late because we sort of sat down and we went through four or five formations, four or five situ- like um, ways of playing and whether it would be, you know, play tall players, whether it would play small players, you know, whether you play, you know, kick the ball from back to front or whether you try and pass the ball out from the back. Yeah. And we sort of all gave in our opinions and, and what we thought. Um, ultimately, the final decision was his and, and he went with the team that he went with, which was, you know, ultimately worked on the day. So that was fine. Um, but, yeah, I, I listen, I expected to be in that, in that starting 11. <laughs> Let alone in the squad. So because I, I just felt that big, after having a decent season, there was probably maybe one more chance for me to to sort of score a goal or make an assist or just perform well, and 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 we would we would sort of make it uh, and we would survive that season. And you said there that you would have get, got at least one chance in a lot of games. We saw you get plenty, uh, especially like I said earlier that, that Portsmouth game. You just equ- uh, sorry, you got one back before half time. What was the team talk like for that game going back into the dressing room at half time? Because obviously that point proved to be pivotal in the race for survival at the end. Yeah, uh, it's, it's interesting because the same as sort of 2 0, 3 1 is is a horrible scoreline, uh, especially when when a team scores just before half time because the team talk completely changes. If, uh, if you go in at half time, sort of 3 0 or or four nil down or so team talks are a little bit different whereas it's like oh can you go out and win the second half whereas at three one if we get another if we get one more goal three two then all of a sudden you can sort of carry on through the rest of the game and you know for the last 10 minutes you can try and push for an equalizer same at same at two nil or two one um so at, at half time we sort of sat in there and gone lads look game's not finished here um just stay, stay compact, stay, you know, as tight as possible. We'll get more chances in the game because we had a few in the first half, um, and we just, again, we just sort of stay, stay calm. We stay, stick, we'll try to stick to the plan as best we could, um, and we put them under a lot of pressure. We start, we started to like turn them a little bit more and and pick up second balls a lot more, and then all of a sudden. You know, one drop for for Kiley, who was able to get his foot in for the penalty, and then obviously the third goal was was actually good play in the end. If you watch it back, it's, mm. it's a few passes before we get to to sort of the goal. So, you know, and I think throughout that time in 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 that game especially, I, I always felt that there was there was going to be chances in that game. Mm. And obviously, we saw a lot of different styles of football during uh, that season, the 18-19 season, uh, from the difference from that Portsmouth game, a lot more attacking, a lot more passing. And I think the Sunderland game in the second half, we played a lot more defensive, sort of sitting back, watching them try and hit them on the counter-attack. Uh, what style of play for you did you really think that was going to play against Sunderland? I think the team selection did sort of play into our hands, but was that a fear for you coming into the game? Honestly, I think the the system and... Um, the style of play didn't matter one bit. It was literally just going to come down to did we have enough in the tank to run around and and press and you know stay compact and everyone stick to the plan as best they could um, and like I say play the game and not the occasion. So yeah. as long as we stuck together and you know chased around as much as we could and did the hard yards. Um, I always, like I say, I always felt that we would come through that game quite, quite nicely. And during your time at Southend, we saw a lot of very good goals from yourself and a lot of good assists too. But what moment would you say for you really stands out as your favourite moment at Southend? Uh, 
I'd probably I would probably say the hat trick the hat trick just the game in general obviously being on Sky and mm-hmm. um, and coming from th- sort of three nil down I think that's probably my highlight uh, for being at Southend I think. Mm. And what about in your career, sort of your favourite ever goal? We've seen you obviously at the likes of Reading and in the national team for Ireland, of course, and at uh, Western Sydney Wanderers too, and, and South End. What goal would you say for you really stands out as your favourite? Uh, well, I've got I've got a few actually. Uh, I've got one at, at mm. Forest where um, sort of got got voted for goal of the season, so that one's. I think that's probably my best goal that I've ever scored. Um, but I've got one for Swindon as well um, that sort of just loops over the goalkeeper. Um, mm. I've got a few, to be honest. Like I think the one at Forest is probably my best ever goal that I've scored. Yeah. And we've seen you obviously move to Australia to play in the early before, obviously, the start of the COVID cases. Uh, for you, do you think the style of football between England and Australia, is there any difference between it at all? Because there are a few divides in depending on what sport's big. Obviously, cricket is massive out in Australia, but yeah. football is sort of our sport over here. Is there any sort of difference in the fans, the style of play? It's uh, it's very different um, in terms of... Oh, hold on. <laughs> Mrs. is moving the sofa about... Um, <laughs> it's, it's very different in terms of uh, over in Australia, they play in really really big stadiums and they play in like AFL stadiums so yeah. uh, and because Australia is such a big country um, you don't get any away support either so no. so you fly into uh, a new territory or new state um, and it's purely home fans but because you're in such a big stadium it's it's basically like say Accrington Stanley playing at the Emirates or yeah or Old Trafford, like that. That's the sort of caliber of stadiums that you're playing in. Um, so it's it's very different in terms of that, uh, in terms of support as well. But obviously, if you get a, a local derby like we have, we have obviously Sydney FC, um, and we're about to have another one for next season. Um, we played in front of thirty thousand. Um, so I mean, you you get because there's obviously only 11 teams in, in the league over there, you get to play each other sort of two or three times. So, you, I mean, you can play in front of 30,000 sort of every five or six weeks. So it's um, so it's, it's actually quite nice. Um, but in terms of style of play, um, over there, they don't really have the, you know, six foot five, six foot six centre forwards. Um, mm-hmm. and, they, uh, and they don't sort of crash it from back to front. It's every football team is trying to pass out from the back and have combinations and um, and play football what I call the right way. So uh, so it is there is a difference because obviously sort of there is in League One, League Two there are sort of still those those big tall centre forwards where where players are mm. are quite happy to kick it from back to front. Um, and but I also think that's down to the fact that there's no promotions and relegations it doesn't really matter too much if you if you know if you don't win for five games or so yeah apart from obviously to your own supporters and your and and your teammates and stuff like that um whereas obviously in the UK if you don't win five or six games your manager's under severe pressure because you could drop in you could be dropping a few places and then all of a sudden you're down by the relegation zone and then the manager's job's on the line so it does make that sort of thing and what's it like with the fans? Obviously, you said about the comparison of how many fans uh, to in a stadium ratio. What's it like when you do get a derby against Sydney FC? What's the sort of atmosphere? Obviously, we've seen at Roots Hall, we've had quite a few good derbies and good atmospheres, uh, such as the last game of the season. What's the atmosphere like between the fans? Amazing. Um, they, they, <laughs> it's, it's really, really strange, actually, because for a relatively new league I think it's only been going sort of 15 years or so 10, yeah. 10 to 15 years um, to have 30,000 at, at, at Derby is, is amazing um, so but the fans they you know they have their their bit of banter and everything else and then there's a little bit of nastiness outside the stadiums which obviously we don't condone and anything else like that so uh, but inside the stadium it builds for a great atmosphere and um you know, especially when you win 
a derby like like we did when when I was there. Um, it was you, know, you couldn't ask for for a better ninety minutes after mm. after the game. The dressing room was amazing. The going out to the bus and things like that. All the fans there greeting you, thinking that you you know you've won the World Cup. It's amazing. <laughs> that really really enjoyable feeling. But then obviously I, I get if you're on the opposite side of that, it'd be the worst feeling in the world. Mm. What was the transition like for you as well? Obviously, Australia pretty much is the other side of the world. <laughs> what was the transition like for you and your family? Uh, well, I went on my own. Um, so my my missus, she uh, she stayed here because she works in London. So yeah. it wasn't really a conversation for us to, to go together because of, of her job here. So um, it was tough. It, not going to lie, it was, like you say, it's not, it's not exactly around the corner. Um, no. so yeah it was very tough um, obviously you have good days and bad days uh, about being being there on your own and stuff like that but ultimately we went we knew together that I was going for a reason and that was to um, you know to go and play and enjoy enjoy playing football and mm. Um, and a bit, a bit of vitamin D as well. <laughs> yeah. And was it sort of an easy decision, decision, sorry, to leave Southend? Obviously, in an interview after you said that you left with a heavy heart. Um, what was it like for you leaving after being there for several years? Yeah, I mean, Southend's I think the longest club I've been at uh, through my career. So um, I, I just felt that after the season that we had and stayed when we stayed up. Um, I went uh, went home after the game, Sunderland game. Um, wanted to sort of sign again for another two years or two or three years, and and finish playing at Southend and, and go into the coaching side and kind of like try and help the young players um, grow and and obviously produce a few for the first team if that was if that was possible. That was sort of my plan. That was what I wanted to do, um, and then. You know, I went on my holidays, went and did my pre-season training like I did the season before. Uh, unfortunately, got injured uh, while I was doing that. Pulled both calves off the bone, or um, and it took me a little bit longer than than I needed to to get back. Um, I'd literally done, I think, probably two days training before the Coventry game, um, mm. and I wasn't even meant to be on the bench. Uh, we, I think it was Drew who was leaving, um, and I was on the bus ready to like obviously going up, and, and we got to the hotel in Birmingham, and uh, and Kevin Bond pulls me aside and he said, "Are you alright for the bench?" And you're never going to say no, uh, and I was like, "Yeah, absolutely." So I was on the bench, and obviously we went one nil down with about 25 minutes to go or so, half an hour to go, and and he put me in me and Humps on and. and after doing two days of training, I was literally I was nowhere near fit enough to to be there. Um, I'd done literally no preseason training whatsoever, but because of because of last season and because of you know the sort of uh, affection that I had for the football club and, and and how much I wanted to get back to the level that I was, I was like, yeah, let, let's you know let, let's get on the bus and let's let's play the game. Yeah. Um, it just wasn't the probably hindsight wonderful thing probably wasn't the right thing to do but like I say because of the affiliation that I have with the football club I wanted to sort of get back to that level. And you said about obviously your plan at the time was to finish playing at Southend and then move into a coaching role we've seen you've been doing your uh, UEFA badges for coaching uh, would you what would you become so you said about player development would you ever move into management? Yeah I think ultimately that's that's what I want to go into um I want to become a manager. I want to be the one who makes the decisions um, and sort of guides the team all the way and hopefully have some success. Um, but I also know I'm not naive enough to think that you, you can go straight into that role. Um, mm -hmm. So if it is individual player uh, development or if it's, you know, striker coach or if it's, you know, to learn um, in the youth teams or anything else like that, then... I'm more than happy to sort of go into that role uh, first and foremost, but ultimately the end goal is to to become a manager. Yeah. Yeah. Would you ever see a uh, return to Root Saw on the cards then? 
<laughs> I always talk to the chairman about that and uh, if he's still in charge I think that one day I might be able to get a return in. Brilliant and uh, just to finish off for today um, we spoke beforehand about uh, your best 11 that you've played over alongside have you got that prepared? Yeah I, I had to pretty much go through the whole <laughs> 30 40 players that I actually played with um, so yeah I have I do have a team um, and just to clarify I was really unhappy that Ben Coker didn't put me in his team <laughs> yeah so I remember him saying having, after having to put him in mine <laughs> so, um, but yeah I was unhappy with that uh, but, um, so yeah so I, I go uh, it's very much a, it's very similar to the team um, that got us very close to to the playoffs um, mm-hmm. with with one or two uh, one or two people that sort of come in. So in goal, uh, Ted Smith uh, for me, mm-hmm. two great feet, um, come and collected from crosses, uh, great shot stopper. Um, yeah, re- really good, I thought, Ted. Uh, just a shame, obviously, with what he's decided to do in his yeah. you know, decided to stop playing at the minute. So that's a bit of a shame because I thought he, before he got injured, um, he, he had a really big future in the game. Um, so he, he was my goalkeeper. Uh, JD at right back. Um, very energetic going forward. Uh, good, good, technically good player. Um Sometimes a little bit suspect <laughs> going backwards, but other than that, he's very good going forward um, and and created a lot for the team, so that was good. Um, Adam Thompson and Anton Ferdinand, two centre halves. I think the partnership they sort of got together um, under Phil Brown was was very good. Um, That's brilliant, and uh, and was one of the reasons why we we did so well in that period. Uh, and then obviously uh, Ben Coker at left back. Um, which I'm put through gritty teeth because yeah, didn't. through gritty teeth, yeah. Um, but coach was, you know, my kind of footballer. He likes to receive the ball. He's um, and and very good going forward, but very solid defensively. Been very unlucky with uh, with injuries, but solid solid uh, left back, especially at uh, League One level. Um, in my eyes, probably should have been playing higher. Um, then I played. Uh, so played four four two really. Um, two two central midfield players, uh, Ryan Leonard um, and Michael Timlin. Yeah. So Ryan Ryan Leonard, <coughs> um, like honestly, one of the most underrated players I think I've ever played with. Um, by by some people, not by his by his peers. Um, done the job basically, allowed everybody else to go forward and let him. Uh, mop up everything else uh, on the counter attacks. So he was incredible for for us, and again one of the main reasons why we we were so good in in, in that period. Um, probably left a little bit um, too too late in my opinion. Probably should have gone the, the in the I think it was either in the January or the summer before. I think he, yeah, I think he left in the January. I believe. Yes. I'm not sure. Should have left in the summer. Um, mm. Because he had a really good season, and then, um, and I think he's, I think he kind of felt like he wanted to go himself. Um, and then um, Tim's is all heart, um, absolute power in terms of, you know, wants the best of everyone. Somebody who shout and ball at you, want you know, demands uh, excellence from you every game, hard work, um, exactly what you kind of need in there. Uh, Right wing, I had uh, Will Atkinson because mm. he did the job um, that nobody's yet, nobody else has been able to replace him by doing, um, which is kind of strange because Will would run 11, 12K in a game, not really do a great deal, but that 11, 12K actually was was vital for, for what we needed. And then he'd pop up with the odd, you know, goal here or assist here, um, because of because of his athleticism. Um, and then on the left, I had Stephen McLaughlin. Um, you know, Macca started seasons really, really well. Then um, kind of had a bit of a 
uh, a bit of a patch where he didn't play so well or got injured. Um, and then he'd come back and, and produce again. So he was he was always able to cross his goals, maybe shot a little bit too much for my liking as a striker. <laughs> lots of crosses. Um, but, you know, nonetheless, he was uh, he was vital for, for what we needed and somebody that we didn't have in, in on the opposite side. So we needed that little bit of, uh, of balance from, from him. Mm. Then up, up top, um, I, I haven't put myself in because it's two, two strikers that I really enjoy playing with. Um, Tom Hopper, um, like I say, somebody who could chase a crisp packet if it was blowing in the wind. Um, great, great guy. Um, workhorse literally would do the ugly side of the game as well as you know he loved his six yard tapping so for him he was he was great and, and a great partner for me and uh the other one I really enjoyed playing with when he was on song which sometimes I think wasn't as much as it should have been but you know for the for the ability that he had and, and the time that we spent together was Nile Ranger um mm. and he for all his flaws and for all of his downside, if he got his head switched on, he would be some player. Uh, I think he's very underrated while he was with us. Um, I just think that he he let himself down. I think he's let himself down in his whole career, in all honesty, um, for everything that he's done. Um, but at the end of the day, if you if you can't change him, you can't change him. That's 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 just the nature of, of the lifestyle that he leads. Um, we try to help him as much as possible um, by tough love, by giving him a little bit extra leeway. But ultimately, he was part of a team that we needed him to produce. And when he wasn't, he was getting told. And when he was, he was also getting the praise. Uh, and rightly so, because he was a player who could change a game on its head if he wanted to. Mm. Thank you very much for joining me, Simon. I'll leave a link to Simon's socials in the description and we'll see you all next week for another episode of Shrimpers Talks. Let's go, let's go, let's go.